Thank you for the uh, introduction. Try it again. Is it not this button? Just that one. Okay. All right. So the uh, motivation for the study is within the uh, field of tissue regeneration or, or tissue engineering, and really a common paradigm within that field is to combine cells and growth factors, which are proteins and genes, and to take kind of this milieu and incorporate this into a scaffold that's then placed at the site of a wound. And you can see the, the, the cartoon there where you have, let's say, a bone defect. We put this biomaterial there. And the hope is that this implanted biomaterial is going to stimulate or to guide regeneration. But there are some real critical limitations with this approach. And one of them is that the regeneration cannot be actively controlled. So basically, it's kind of a set it and forget it approach. There, there are passive processes that are going to be dominating the regeneration that occurs there. And this has then uh, caused problems in the translation of these approaches for both safety and efficacy. And to this day, we still don't really have any good biomaterials that are used clinically for the regeneration of soft tissue and, and bone. And so our vision then is to come up with a material where we can non-invasively control regeneration using ultrasound. So let me tell you how we are doing that here. So our approach is to use cells that contain a gene switch. And so this gene switch is heat activated and ligand inducible. So we have a, uh, you can see the, the cartoon there on the left, we require a heat shock, there's a heat shock promoter, as well as a ligand, which is a, a heterodimerizer. And only in the presence of both the heat shock as well as the, the ligand do we get gene expression. And so downstream of these regulators, we can put whatever gene we want. So for example, we can do a reporter gene like luciferase or VEGF, uh, which is involved with blood vessels, or BMP, which is involved for, for bone growth. So the objective of this study then is, <clears throat> excuse me, to use HIFU to spatially and temporally control um, gene expression in cells that contain the switch. So let's see what we actually did. So first, let's talk about um, the scaffold that we use. So I told you that kind of the paradigm within engineering, tissue engineering, is to deliver cells using a scaffold. And hydrogels are used very extensively within the field. However, they have a very high water content, which means they have a low attenuation, which means that they're not going to heat very well. And so that's a, a picture of an SEM of, of fibrin. So our approach then is to generate a composite scaffold. And this is a composite scaffold that's going to contain fibrin as our base, but also hydroxyapatite. And hydroxyapatite is the main mineral component of bone. It's used quite extensively in orthopedic applications. And you can see that as we increase the concentration of hydroxyapatite in our scaffold, we can also uh, get a, a fairly robust increase in attenuation so that when we expose these scaffolds to HIFU, and you can see our, our experiment there, you get a, a temperature increase that is consistent with the hyperthermia that we're generating. Okay. So next, let's look at some of the in vitro studies that we did. So first off, we need to ensure that our cells are happy in this environment. And so we looked at metabolic activity over the course of seven days. And you can see that there are basically the same um, metabolic activity in our, in our regular fibrin scaffolds as in our, our composite scaffolds. So the takeaway is our cells are happy. Next, what we did was we put our cells inside the scaffold. We exposed them to increasing uh, intensities of HIFU. So for the fibrin-only group, you see that the amount of gene expression is relatively low. For the, um, for the dark colored bars, which are our composite scaffolds, you see that there's a very significant increase, almost a hundredfold increase in the gene expression once you get to the 200 watts per centimeter squared level and above. So very robust gene activation. We can also spatially pattern this gene activation by rastering um, the ultrasound transducer across our scaffolds. And we can get different profiles of activation, different widths of activation. So to kind of wrap up, we also did an in vivo study where we looked at the ability to, to activate these cells in implants in mice. So we implanted um, implants in a C3H mouse model uh, on day zero. Then 24 hours after, we um, inject our rapamycin. So remember, we need the ligand and then we apply the HIFU. So we're applying both of the stimuli on day one. We then image for four days afterward to look at the type of gene expression that we get. We then reactivate on day seven. So this is the same set of implants that were uh, placed on day zero, and then we do the subsequent imaging. And this HIFU was done at 2.5 megahertz um, with a two-minute exposure. 
And so on the left there, you can see the top image. We put a fluorescent marker inside our scaffold. We can confirm that each mouse does indeed have two scaffolds. But on the bottom image, we see that only the scaffold that is exposed to HIFU actually shows, uh, in this case, the reporter expression. We can then quantify this type of expression based on a region of interest analysis. You see that we get a very significant increase in the plus HIFU group that decreases over time. And then one week later, we can reactivate. And we get similar levels of activation one week after. So to conclude, HIFU can be used to both spatially and temporally control um, transgene expression in our cells that have the heat activated and the ligand inducible gene switch. And using our composite scaffolds, we can get activation at lower acoustic intensities. And so our next step then is to be doing activation studies with VEGF and BMP2 transgenes. And so in the top left there, you see an initial study that we did with BMP2 using an F luciferase uh, reporter line um, that responds to BMP. So I'd like to acknowledge our funding, especially the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, which supported this work. Um, and thank you for your attention. Any questions? What kind of, tell me what kind of cells you do, you're dealing with. So this is a, a murine mesenchymal stem cell line. Mesen so stem cell line. And then, so did you, it's autologous basically, an autologous stem cell line. Correct. Yeah. Okay, correct. so you didn't see any uh, rejection or any immune cell infiltration into the scaffold when you harvested? Correct, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so one question, maybe I missed it, but uh, how long do you need to heat and to which temperature until you see uh, the expression? So with HIFU, we can get expression. So we're heating about basically between 43 to 45 degrees C. We get activation within two minutes. Now the interesting point with these cells, and we have previous publications using a hyperthermic water bath, is that you actually need with a water bath to heat for 20 to 30 minutes using just a water bath. And so I, our hypothesis, and we have yet to prove or disprove this, is I think there's an additional effect of the, me the mechanical effect of the ultrasound that's facilitating this, this gene expression such that we could get activation in a much shorter time window with the high foo versus the hyperthermic water bath. Okay. Could you do Thank this you. with therapeutic ultrasound? Sorry, say again? Could you do this with therapeutic ultrasound, physical therapy ultrasound? In terms of the, like the, the yeah. at-home ones? But potentially, we haven't looked at the pulse, but that's definitely something that we wanna look at. Great. Yeah, Thank you. No, no, it's nice oh. to see this uh, to see this extent. And we tried some similar things a few years ago. But one of the problems is also the HSP 70 p you promoter is of course it's a stress sensitive. It's not only a heat sensitive, and especially if you put it into a such such an, an uh, environment, can you avoid expression of that in, at, at, uh, just because of stress other than temperature? Agreed, and I think that was the motivation for my colleagues that developed the cell line to have the, the two-component regulation um, that it requires the ligand in addition to the heat shock, and what that also opens up is the ability to have multiple cell types. So, for example, if we wanted to do vascularized bone, we could have one set of cells that produces VEGF in response to one ligand, and then a set of cells that produce BMP2 in response to a second ligand. But I, I completely agree with your point that the selectivity of just the, the heat shock promoter is, I think, is not enough for this application. Thank you. Thank you.